the results of a project that we've been undertaking. Did it back? Oops, this should work. Not too far. A project that we've been um, conducting, uh, myself, Phil, and uh, more recently uh, Chris Hooker, who lives down in uh, Newbury uh, near Oxford, who got involved. Um, and it's studying the, um, how to interpret the polarisation of moonlight. And I'll explain what polarisation is and how moonlight becomes polarised. And I'll also show you how we've, we think we've discovered a way in which you can analyse the polarisation of moonlight to tell you about the composition of the lunar surface. In particular, how you can de deduce the refractive index of the grains on the lunar surface. I'll explain what refractive index is as well. Um, we developed uh, theories to try and explain what the, how to interpret the, uh, the results we're getting from our telescopes. We also conducted experiments to try and uh, corroborate the theories with you know, real ground truth um, materials rather than you know, remote moon dust on the moon that we can't access. Um, and then we'll show you how that ties in with the observations we've been uh, obtaining and how that can be used to study lunar mineralogy and stratigraphy. And all this uh, can be done with, with amateur kit. It doesn't require a very expensive scientific equipment. So, to start with, uh, what is polarisation? Is everybody, or is anybody familiar with the structure of a light wave? Well, it's, it's basically a, an oscillating electrical field. So it's um, that it moves through space. It has uh, an electric field component, which um, it comprises a, a force field that points in a particular direction in space for a given light ray. So if, if there was a light ray coming from the wall, in fact, the light ray that's bouncing off this wall here and coming into your eyes, a particular light ray would have, for example, an electric field which points vertically up and down and it oscillates in opposite directions as it passes towards you. There would be another one that has an oscillation in that direction, another one in that direction, and a multitude of different directions. It's all sort of random, but each individual ray has an electric field which oscillates in a particular direction for that ray. <coughs> now, so that, that's this, its own personal polarisation, but general uh, sunlight um, comprises countless trillions of these light rays, so collectively speaking, uh, sunlight isn't polarised overall because there's all possible orientations of this electric field for all the millions and millions and millions of rays of light that come from the sun and bounce off the surface of the earth and you know, give us uh, light that we see by. So that itself isn't polarised, but what you find is that when light reflects from a reflective surface such as a puddle or a pane of glass or some such thing, the act of reflection forces a certain amount of polarisation in the reflected light and the transmitted light, and it's all to do with the the, the physical position of the reflecting surface in relation to the physical orientation of this oscillating electric field. So if we take the unpolarised light coming from the sun, I've just shown here schematically, all sorts of different <coughs> orientations for these multitude of electrical fields that are coming along these multitude of rays, hits a flat surface, which is in a plane perpendicular to this wall. The rays that are have an electric field vector which oscillates parallel, in plane with the surface, and preferentially reflected up. So, preferentially you have these, these solid circles here represent electric fields that oscillate in this direction. And those that are not preferentially pass through. So the reflected sunlight is partially polarised. There's more of it that's os that has electric vectors oscillating in this direction than in that direction. And you'd be familiar with this if you're used to wearing polaroid sunglasses or you do a photography and you've got a polaroid filter on your camera to remove reflected glare uh, from a reflecting surface. So in this example, this photograph here, it's just like a puddle, it's just you know, a reflecting surface like this. Here is glass, it could be water, like uh, I showed in the photograph. And you can see the reflected image of the clouds in the sky on the surface of the water. So that's this bit, as it were. And you can also see the stones underneath. So that's this bit that's gone through the water, bounced at the bottom and come back up. Now this one, we've got a polarising filter on there, which extracts this bit. So it blocks this bit altogether, and you just have this bit. And you can see clearly that you've got two components. You've got the bit that goes through that bit, and you've got the bit that bounces at the top of that bit. So that's 
That's the basic physics of polarization and how reflection of light can cause it to be polarized in this way. You can have a, a preferred direction in which the electric vector, the electric field oscillates. So that's, that's for a, a puddle on Earth. But in physics, what's good for a puddle on Earth is good for the moon. And the same thing happens on the moon. Rather than pools of water, would have grains of moon dust. So when the light hits a grain of moon dust, some of it bounces off the surface, some of it passes into the grain. The stuff that bounces off the surface is partly polarized in just the same way as the, the, the light reflecting from the puddle of water is partly polarized. Now, this has been well known for quite some time. Um, <coughs> the graph I'm showing you here is a um, result from a professional astronomer of some time ago, 60, 67, it's got, 66, 67 it's got here. And it shows the degree of polarization, the measured degree of polarization in moonlight as a function of the, the phase of the moon. So here we're talking about the results that they measured when the moon was full. Here we're looking at the results they measured when the moon was last quarter, here first quarter. So these are, that's uh, one week from there and that's one week from there. <coughs> now, the definition of the degree of polarization is, is pretty simple. But you have to think about the geometry of the observation before you can understand what this quantity is. It's a made-up quantity, but it's a sensible one. Imagine um, a line joining the sun to the moon to the reflective point that you're looking at through your telescope, and another line joining that point to your telescope, and then a line joining back to the sun. That defines a triangle, an imaginary triangle. That, the plane of that triangle is called the scattering plane. It's a plane containing the incoming ray and the outgoing ray. Now, the degree of polarization is the ratio of the difference between the amount of polarization you get for light with vectors oscillating in plane compared to those os oscillating in plane. So, you take any amount of light coming from the surface of the moon, you can measure how much of all of that light has is oscillating in this direction. And you can measure how much of all of that light is oscillating in that direction. If there's no net polarization, and that is the same as that, then this difference will be zero. And so the net polarization of that overall quantity of moonlight is going to be zero. And that happens at full moon, actually. But at different phases of the moon, when it's first quarter, last quarter, half moon, here or here, it's actually quite a big difference. So you find that there's, there's more light oscillating like this than there is like this because it's been reflected off the surface at roughly 100 degrees. This angle is roughly 100 degrees. And they've measured how this degree of polarization varies, how much this exceeds that as a function of the phase of the moon over a full lunation there. And you can see that it rises to a peak at first or last quarter. And that's, that's something that we're going to be following a bit more. Now these are uh, some of our results, so in, in that instance, in that graph I showed you before, that was for the entire moon, that was the whole moon, the moonlight from the whole thing. Um, but we've been measuring the uh, polarization of moonlight for regions, we've been mapping it across regions of the moon. And it's, it's quite, quite well known that that general change in the degree of polarization as the moon goes through its complete lunation over a month applies not only to the full moon, sorry, to, to the, the entire moon, but also to each point, each part of the moon. You look closer, you see the same thing. You look closer, you see the same thing. You just need more detail. And I'm showing you this graph here to show you a, 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 a general trend that's also well known, but it's, it's um, uh, worth bearing in mind. Here we've got a region of the uh, southwest portion of the moon, uh, not far from the limb, so the, the, the limb will come up here, the edge of the moon will come up there. We've got the dark regions of the mare here, which are sort of lava basalts and then the bright highland regions of the moon, which are older. And we've got the polarization map here. Uh, yellows and, and pale colors are high degree of polarization, and dark is low degree of polarization. And you can see straight away that for the dark areas of the moon, we get a high level of polarization. And for bright areas of the moon, we get a lower level of polarization. You can see this, this string of mountains here, bright mountains, shows up as a dark polarization region. Um, but the rest of it is generally uh, higher in polarization than everywhere else. So this is, embodies what's 
or well known what's called Oron's Law, it's the uh, name of the eponymous uh, Russian who discovered the relationship. And that is that if you plot this, this degree of polarization against the brightness of the surface that's producing that polarization, you get a, a pretty linear, it's, it's scattered, but it's a fairly strong linear correlation. This is on logarithmic scales, and if you're not familiar with logarithmic scales, don't worry about it. It's basically, you, get a, you can get a linear relation. <coughs> so that means that um, bright areas, bright, brighter is up here, darker is down there, high polarization is up there, low polarization is down there. So bright areas have low polarization. That's these areas. We saw it before. The, the, the previous map was for there. That region there. So the bright areas have low polarization, the dark areas have high polarization. You can see that from the map. So that doesn't really tell you a great deal. But what the professionals did find was that it's not always the case. There are some regions of the moon that don't quite sit along this <coughs> linear trend. They're sort of, um, they're, uh, they're anomalous. Polarization anomaly. To get this data, they, they, the professionals just measured the brightness and the polarization degree for each one of these yellow points on here. And for each one of these yellow points, there's a data point on one of these four scattergraphs. Um, you can see the linear trend going straight away. So, what we wanted to look at is what does this actually tell us? The professionals found that these anomalous uh, data points correspond with bright craters. And they weren't entirely sure why that should be the case. Now, what I'm showing you here is what's called an albedo map. So that's just a map of the brightness of a region of the moon. This is the Sea of Serenity on one side. It's actually, look at it that way. So there's the top of the moon over there. There's the, there's the east and there's the south down there. And this is the degree of polarization for that exactly the same region of the moon. And you probably notice that it sort of looks like a, a, a photographic negative. Um, if you are a tremendous film. If I do. Or if you photoshop it and, and you know, do, do it. Again. This is what it would look like. And this really just illustrates that on its own, this, this linear trend in the overflow doesn't really tell you a great deal because all it does is it just produces this negative. So if I, if I try to find, if I ask what information that the linear trend is telling me, I, well, what's the point in going to all the trouble of measuring the polarization and measuring the brightness and plotting it on a graph and then producing this map? Well, all I need to do is take a photograph and, and then take the negative and get the same result. Most of the time, and it's, it's, the, it's those times where it doesn't follow that trend, you, you get this. The, these, these data points here correspond to something which does not correspond to that negative. So, for example, if, if there was a region of, of this mare here on the moon which didn't follow that, <coughs> that trend, that linear trend, then they would show up here as being odd. It wouldn't look like they should in a, in a negative, in a, in, a, in a photographic negative style. It would stand out as being odd, anomalous. And that's what we've been looking to try and explain what does the anomaly mean. Yeah, I'll get used to this. Okay. So current thinking about what this might mean, why why we get these funny data points coming off the line here. Current thinking is that they're related to the size of the uh, particles, the, the, the lunar grains on the surface of the moon. Uh, current thinking is that they, you, you get these strange and almost points when you're looking at regions where there's uh, an above average grain size. And that sort of fits in with um, why they appear around fresh craters. Fresh craters tend to be surrounded by all the stuff that's been thrown out you during the, the uh, impact explosion. That tends to be blocky and relatively large grain sizes, which over a long period of time get ground down and pulverized into smaller grains by repeated micrometeorite impacts on the moon over eons and eons. But initially, when they're young and when they're bright, the grain sizes tend to be larger. So that's why initially they thought that this is just a, a property of the, these unusually large grains. They're just showing up here. It's a way of measuring where, a way of detecting where on the surface of the moon you have 
uh, new areas, new surface material which has larger grain sizes. And they uh, derived a, uh, using the lunar samples determined by the Apollo astronauts, that derived an expression which relates this quantity B, that, so this is just a straight line equation, this is an equation for that red line there. And if you vary B, you effectively shift the red line up. So this is effectively saying that there's a sm this group of bright points down here can be described by another straight line with a larger value of B than the equation for that straight line. So they're all, they're all actually obeying Hummel's law. But for this group down here, they've just got a slightly larger value of B because with that group of bridges down there, the grain diameter is larger, and that makes the B quantity larger in the equation. So it just shifts these, this group wholesale up to one side. But they stay on a straight line, so to speak. So that's the current interpretation. We think that's probably not quite right. <clears throat> and I'll hand over to Phil to explain how we deduce that. OK. Well, I'm going to first of all describe how we try to reproduce this Umoff relationship that Andrew's been talking about, the relationship uh, between brightness and polarisation. So the first thing we needed to be able to do was use our telescopes to measure the polarisation of the moonlight. So how did we do that? Well, we have a polarising filter, which we bought for the telescope. It's a one and a quarter inch polarising filter that you can fit on the telescope. And you can use a camera and take photographs of the moon through the filter. So what you need to do is use that to measure how polarised the light is. Andrew pointed out that the light from the moon isn't completely polarised. It's sort of polarised a different, by different amounts, depending on where you're looking. So the basics of measuring polarisation can be illustrated here by this picture, which has a pair of Polaroid sunglasses held up to a computer screen. Now, it happens that the light from the computer screen is polarised, and you'll notice that depending on what angle you hold the, the sunglasses at, more or less of the light shines through. So there's the clue. If we put the polarising filter on the telescope and turn it through different angles, and we can measure the amount of light that comes through for these different angles, we can measure the polarisation. And here, there is a position where no light comes through at all. And if you, if I just get up to look, down, no other way, there we are. So here's the angle of the sunglasses. Here's how much light's coming through, how bright it is. And we come down to some angle, don't know what it is, but there's that angle, <coughs> as you saw, where the light drops to nothing. And that is a fully polarized source because there is a point where you get no light at all. But the moon isn't like that, it isn't completely polarised. What you get in that case when you vary the angle of your polarising filter on the telescope is a line that has the same shape, it's this curve again, but it doesn't go all the way down to nothing. It goes down to, in this case, 50%. I've just made that up, but here's 100% of the light at one angle, and at another angle it's only 50% of that. And we can work out the amount of polarisation <coughs> just by saying, Divide this height of the curve here by the height, the two terms there, twice that, one of those. And this then gives you a little expression of the amount of polarisation. And if you do, if you look at the previous curve, you'll finally get an answer which is one. If it was a straight line, you'd get an answer which is nothing. So the curve we saw on the first thing, the computer screen, would be one or 100% polarised. In this case, it's a third. So we can do by using that equation, we can measure the polarisation of points on the moon, but we've got to uh, use a telescope for that. So here's the equipment. I've put a polarising filter on <coughs> the end of this camera, which is a DVK camera. I don't know whether any of you use a DVK, but they're quite common for amateur astronomy. Quite a lot of people use them to take pictures of the planets and the moon. In fact, I take pictures <coughs> of the planets with it myself. And this is my telescope, which is an Alex 210 inch telescope. Uh, in a, in a sort of shed observatory. And the first method we used to measure the polarisation was to rotate the whole camera and the filter. And you can see I've got two different positions here in the camera. I physically turn the whole thing and we take a picture and see how bright it is at that angle. And we turn it to that angle, we take another picture and see how bright it is at that angle, just like we did in that first picture with the, with the sunglasses, different angles, different brightnesses. Now, that method turned out to be quite laborious, because if you can imagine, you end up with pictures that are also rotated, your picture of the moon goes round. <laughs> so, you, uh, we, we, we did a bit of um, work, DIY work, and created this contraption for doing it instead. In this case, 
little polarising filter is in there. This is an old Barlow lens. There's the camera again. And you can just keep moving the filter around by one of those little notches, which is 10 degrees at a time. So that's how we do it now. And when we've done that, let's give you an example. Here's a picture of the, the Alphonsus region of the moon. I'm not very good at identifying craters. I think that's Alphonsus. Is it? Oh, nice. <laughs> Three, six years on the project, I, I don't know my craters yet. So, uh, the observation method is, I guess some people have done some high-res moon photography by taking a video. What amateur astronomers tend to do these days is to they put a camera like this DBK on the telescope, they take a video which is hundreds and hundreds of pictures of the moon, then they stack them up, that's add them all together to get a better, the, sum of the, 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 the final image is better than the sum of the parts, if you like. So this program, which is a common one that people use, adds together a load of images and gets a, a good final result. So we take lots of videos at different angles, several hundred frames each, align and stack them with Reggie Staff, which some of you, I guess, will have heard of. And then we get this. Now, oh, I don't know if it's easy enough to see, but in this little blue circle here, I've picked out a capture of the moon and written down the angle of the polarizer for each case. And if you look closely, you can probably see that that is darker than that one there. There's a subtle variation in darkness. Does that show through? Just. Just. See, it's not completely polarised, like the other thing. It's not a completely strong signal. But when you plot a graph of those different points, so there's a graph of the points of the measured brightness inside the blue circle for, against the angle the polarizer was at, we do get that shape. So we've succeeded in measuring the polarisation of that one little point inside the crater which is next to Alphonsus, which isn't Alphonsus. What's that one then? Ptolemaeus. <laughs> 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 Very good. <laughs> I don't know if he's right, he could be bluffing. That's not a contradiction in the room. The third one, the smallest, is Albategnis, Al right. I think. Okay. <laughs> so, we measured the polarisation of one point. In fact, when I first start on this project, Andrew had done this all by hand and plotted himself a little graph based on one pixel in his image. And I said, well, there are another million to go. So <laughs> <laughs> probably took you several I'll hours. See you later. So, so it took you several hours to do that one. So I think we're going to need the computer to do that. So <laughs> that was proof of principle. Proof of principle, yeah. So we we do that now with a computer. We measure that curve at every single point, and that's how we get these graphs of the amount of polarization. And that's that same image. Again, as Andrew pointed out, the, uh, oops, the darker areas and the lighter areas have different degrees of polarisation. Roughly speaking, the darker areas have more polarisation than the lighter areas. So we have a map of the polarisation fraction of that particular area there that we've measured. So what comes after that? Ah, yes. Now, the UMOF line that Andrew showed you had two axes, like most graphs. It had the brightness along the bottom, and the polarisation at the side. So we've measured the polarisation, but we need to measure the brightness as well to get the graph, don't we now? Here's a nice picture of the moon. That's brightness straight away. This area is <coughs> be dark, this area is brighter, so you'd think you could just use the any old picture of the moon to determine the brightness. There's only one by its snag, isn't there? This area here, near the terminator, is that really, really that dark? Or is it just the fact that it's lunar dawn? Lunar evening, dawn, dawn. yes. <laughs> Morning sunrise there, really quite dark, low light, the sun's coming in over that area, it makes it look relatively dark. Here, the sun's more or less overhead, and it makes it look very bright. Now, these areas may be brighter, but they're not that much brighter. So what we had to do was a bit, bit of trickery, we had to calibrate our images. So the first thing to do was to work out the latitude and longitude of all the points on the moon. Uh, we do that by just taking some known craters and calibrating where everything is. And then when you've done that, you can work out a second set of coordinates which relate to where the sun is at any point. So you can say, oh, it's midday for this point here, the sun's overhead. It's early morning here, the sun's at a very low angle. And you can then adjust the brightness of the image and compensate for how high the sun is in the sky. And if you do that for this image, you get that. Oops. So there it is. Is that area really dark? No. 
it's been adjusted. That's the same image with a mathematical <coughs> correction for where the sun is in the sky for every point. So now we have the true brightness and we have the polarisation, which is the two things we wanted to plot on our graph, just to check that those professionals weren't making that line up. So we plot the degree of polarisation measured from our measurements against the brightness that we just saw, the corrected brightness, and lo and behold, we get a nice straight line like that. And we see that it does have some width. And this is what we want to, to investigate. Is there something about the difference from the distance from that line, which is telling us something about the surface of the moon? Because that's what it's all about. As Andrew said, if you had a perfect straight line, that would just mean that one image was the negative of the other. The fact that it deviates from that line, what we call the polarisation anomaly, is something that we want to explain and work out what it means. So, there's the observation procedure with a telescope taken from the back garden in Manchester, where seeing conditions are not brilliant, but it does work. We can get that result. So it's ready for some more science now. Over to our physicist. Yeah, okay. So, uh, as Phil says, we can reproduce this, but we want to try and get a handle on what on earth it actually means. Okay, so we need to try and model or represent uh, moon dust, because we know all this light is being reflected from moon dust. <coughs> we hope the entire surface of the moon is covered in lots of very fine dust, the astronauts can tell us that. Um, so, how, how can we do that? How can we sort of uh, model that? Well, we can use a mathematical model, which is what we did. <clears throat> and we can build a mathematical uh, lunar grain in the computer and we can fire mathematical sun rays at it and then measure the amount of polarization that comes off of those and see if we can reproduce that mathematically. And if we can, then we can control, we can ask the question which of our theoretical parameters for our model grain are responsible for different structures in this graph. So, so what do we know about you know, the first thing about the building model is actually look at reality and make sure that you're, you're doing something sensible. <coughs> well, what we know about the moon is, as I said, it's covered in fine dust. The dust mostly comprises shattered tiny grains of, of rock, so it is mineral rock, <coughs> and lots of bits of glass, which are in tiny bead form or in, in shells, shattered shells. The glass comes from, uh, is a relic of impact processes, uh, an asteroid or a uh, meteorite or something, smashes into the, the moon surface, causes an explosion, shatters lots of the, the rock just underneath the surface of the moon, <coughs> produces these uh, small grains of shattered rock, but it also melts some of the rock, because there's a lot of energy uh, turned into heat, the heat melts the rock, produces a lot of glass. So uh, this is a, a a bead, a solidified bead of glass that was sprayed out as molten glass when the, the impact took place. And this one survived so far, so that might be a relatively young piece of impact glass. The other bit, there's one there. The other bits of glass, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe that one, a bit of glass. That might be uh, another piece of impact glass. We've been around before. It got hit subsequently by another impact and broke into a, uh, a shard of glass. So there's lots of this stuff. Average particle size is around about 50 microns. <coughs> these particles. Um, so there's lots of rock, there's lots of glass, and there's this thing called space weathering on these grains. The space weathering is, is basically, if you think, um, go back to the impact process I was telling you about, it produces glass, which is melted rock, it sprays the, the glass out around the area of the impact where the impact took place, obviously that lands back onto the surface. <clears throat> and it produces a fine coating around the existing grains. And that's effectively space weathering. The more, the older a particular grain is, or the more time it's been exposed on the lunar surface, they found that it tends to have a thicker and thicker layer of this, like an icing on a cake, effectively, is space weathering. And they found that the, the, the layer also contains tiny nanometer sized, tiny beads of pure iron, which is liberated in the, in the, uh, the heat of, of melt because the, the, the crystals themselves, the rock itself, comprises uh, molecules comprising iron, but in a, an iron oxide form in the mineral. During the heating process, that's sort of heated out and the, 
the glass is produced and the iron part is liberated out into liquid metal iron as a vapour and that all mixes up in this mess which then settles back on the surface and ices the particles there, that's space weathering. Now we need to take all of this into account when we're doing our modelling. So, <coughs> imagine a Malteser if you will. That's basically our mathematical model. We have a, a spherical particle, because that's the easiest thing to describe mathematically, and it doesn't make any assumptions about jacket shapes that you can't really justify. And that's got a uh, clean um, crystal block inside. And then it's got a, a layer, so that, that's the honeycomb centre for Malteser. And it's got a, 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 a space weathering coating, that's, that's uh, iron beads and glass coating that I was talking about. That's rather like the, the, the chocolate and Malteser. Um, and that will have a certain amount of uh, iron uh, beads inside it. Now we can, we can model, we can represent, we can quantify all of these terms in our equations. We just have a, a value d for the, the uh, grain diameter, the core diameter, a small d for the thickness of the, of the uh, space where they're encoding, a certain proportion <coughs> of iron oxide, uh, of uh, nanophase iron particles in there. And also this thing called refractive index, which we'll look at in much more detail later, which is a, a, the optical the optical density, if you like, the optical density of the rock. So we use all these parameters, we do the maths, we get an equation. <coughs> and we can calculate the polarization for a given amount of light coming into this theoretical particle using this equation for any particle we like. So we've got complete freedom to choose whatever value we want for those five parameters. And what we actually do is we say, well, we've got to be sensible about this. We know from the, the, the lunar return samples that there is only a certain range of, of diameter sizes on the surface of the moon. There's only a certain range of thicknesses of the space weather. There's only a certain range of the amount of tiny iron oxide. Oh, by the way, this is an example just to show you. I'm not making this up. Uh, this is a, an example grain returned from the moon. Uh, it's got a bit of space weathering on it there. It doesn't cut the whole of it, but it's cut a lot of it. And they've put that grain into some epoxy resin, and then they've sawn through it, through the middle. And you can see the saw marks here. So you can see what's inside. So this is the example here. We've got the, 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 uh, the mineral grain in there, we've got the space weathering there, and these tiny black dots are pure eye beads, a, a nanometer across, and then back into the epoxy resin that the, uh, that the um, scientists embedded the thing in. So we can change all these parameters, we do it within ranges, and we pick a fixed number of possible different values within each range. So that gives us, taking all the possible values in all the five ranges, that gives us about 100,000 different combinations of those different values. And we calculate the polarization, and we calculate the brightness for each theoretical particle. So we have 100,000 different results, and we plot those on logarithmic axes, polarization against brightness and hey presto we get exactly the linear relation we're hoping for. So we can produce this theoretically this, this linear trend between polarization and brightness. And then what we can do is we can look to see which of the parameters we've chosen for our particle produce what sort of shape. And it's pretty subtly, pretty simple, thankfully. <laughs> what we find is um, there are four particles, uh, sorry, four parameters which have the effect of pushing the data point, stretching out the line. So the, the linearity along the line here is produced by variations in the size of the particle, the amount of space weathering it's got, uh, the thickness of the space weathering, and the, uh, the absorption of the particle, the, the rock inside the particle. So basically, the more opaque the particle is, the further up this line the data point will be for that particular particle. Now, very different to that is the parameter for the refractive index. That produces a very different structure, and it produces exactly the structure we're looking for on this other plot. If you vary the refractive index, so that's sort of the optical, the optical density of the, the uh, mineral inside, the uh, Maltese honeycomb, you vary that in steps, you get a series of parallel repeat lines, each one independently and uniquely for that particular refractive index, which is completely different from any of these. So what that means is that we can 
decouple, completely decouple the effects of the refractive index of the mineral from all of the effects of all of the other parameters for that particular part of you. So our interpretation then is that what we have <coughs> here in this <coughs> historical graph are actually two UMUF lines. There's one UMUF plot for one group of particles <coughs> across the moon's surface which have one lower refractive <coughs> index and there's another UMUF line for bright particles which this sits on of a higher refractive index. Now, the professionals have said, well, we think this is because actually the, the particles on this red line are larger particles and the particles on the blue line are smaller particles. I think that's probably true, but that's not why they're on different lines. It turns out that in fact the, the particles that you would expect to be larger tend to come from a mineral that has a naturally higher refractive index. It comes from a mineral called um, hyroxy. Uh, and the minerals on here tend to be dominated by plagioclase, which tends to break up into smaller particles. So the bright fresh craters, where you, you tend to see larger particles, those larger particles <coughs> tend to be um, pyroxene, and pyroxene does have a higher refractive index. So that's our interpretation of this existing, okay. this existing uh, data, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in more detail a little bit later. For the moment I want to, and this is where the equations come in, I'll be as quick as I can about this. I want to get a handle on what refractive index actually means. I've been banding this term around refractive index, but um, what does it actually tell us? <coughs> well, think about, um, <coughs> think about the structure of a crystal of, of rock. Uh, there's a simple crystal here, it's a, a silicon oxide, so it's a silicate type. Uh, crystal structure which is present in many rocks. You have oxygen, uh, silicon atoms and oxygen atoms, there's a tetrahedral structure, so you've got a little silicon atom and there are <coughs> four oxygen atoms around it forming a tetrahedron and this repeats throughout the entire structure. Now think about any one, particularly think about the oxygen atom, because that's, that's the one that dominates really. Think about one of these oxygen atoms in here, I'm, I'm showing it here. We know that the atom comprises a cloud of electrons uh, centred upon um, a neutron. So we've got a negative cloud of charge and a positive particle in the middle. And this is a simple mechanical model to allow us to get a handle on, on what's going on here. <coughs> negative charge, uh, positive centre, they attract. Along comes um, a, a light wave. And I mentioned before that a light wave is an electric, uh, a travelling electric field oscillates in a particular plane, it's polarised in that particular plane. And this is the electric field here. So I've got this electric field. It's, um, this is one instant in time. So the, the light wave comes along and at, at an instant in time the, the, the electric field is pointing that way. Then half a wavelength later it will be pointing that way, down. And then half a wavelength later it will be pointing up as it travels through the crystal, it travels over this atom. <coughs> so how is this going to respond? We've got an electric field. We've got uh, a movable negative charge, or any charge in an electric field, moves in response to the electric field. So it will be pulled in one direction. The, the electron cloud will be pulled in one direction. And then as the, the light wave progresses uh, uh, across the atom, it's the direction of the light wave, the electric field and the light wave will swap, and the cloud of charge will be pulled in another direction. So it will be oscillating backwards and forwards over this nucleus here, the positive nucleus. Now this is represented in terms of sort of a spring return force between the electron cloud and the nucleus. Because remember, these, these opposite charges attract, so the, the light wave is trying to pull the electron field off the nucleus, the nucleus is trying to pull the electron field back on. And as the light wave field vector is changing direction, the, uh, the nucleus momentarily wins and then it starts to lose again and then the electric field of the light waves flips over and the whole thing reverses. But it's going backwards and forwards, so it's sort of a tug of war between the two of them. Now we know from Isaac Newton <coughs> that force is mass times acceleration. So we know we can just write the mass of the, of the electron cloud as m, we know the second differential for uh, acceleration. What we need to do is just quantify what the forces are. So as, as long as we know we we'll get this right for the forces, this is sort of a 
this is a default expression. <coughs> we need to get the forces right on this side of the equation. We have the force that comes from the light field, this oscillating light field with the frequency omega, pulling in one direction, and acting against it, negative sign, we have the return force of these springs that uh, come from the, the nucleus. <coughs> so these two balancing forces have to be equal to the mass times the acceleration of the whole setup. So that's our second order differential equation. We solve that and we get an expression for the position, the maximum stretch that you get on the electron cloud relative to the nucleus as the light wave passes across it. It's oscillating backwards and forwards like this of the, of the nucleus and it will stretch to a lesser or greater extent according to this expression. Now, <coughs> I'm going to jump a little bit without explaining, but this expression and this expression can be used together to give you this. This is the refractive index, this is the thing we measure. And this part comes from all of this. Now, the, the take home message is that the refractive index that we're measuring is tied up in all of these atomic parameters. So the value of m and the value of epsilon and the value of omega, zero, these are all properties of that atom. So that means if I pass my light wave over a particular atom, I'll get a, a value of n, or squared in this case, which is unique to that atom because that atom has specifically that value for that atom and that value for that atom and that value and so on. It goes over a different atom, I'll get a different set of atomic parameters, so I'll get a different refractive index value. So that means if I'm measuring stuff, I don't know what it is, but I'm seeing, however I'm measuring it, I'm seeing what I think are results which tell me there are different refractive index values on the surface I'm measuring. And that tells me they're different because the atoms in the surface are different. And if the atoms in the surface are different, then the crystals that I'm looking at are different. So the, the differences in refractive index that we're measuring directly tell us that the, the atomic structure, the crystal structure, the actual matter that the light's reflecting from is different for this, for this reason. <coughs> so, I'll give you an example of how this how this can help us. Um, I've got a schematic of uh, glass uh, molecules, a glass structure here. <coughs> it's not crystal, it's amorphous, so it's not bound up in a regular structure. It's got a particular refractive index, it's silicon and oxygen. A refractive index value of uh, 1.5. <coughs> we have diamond here, it's made out of it's a crystal structure made out of carbon atoms. So these atoms are completely different to those atoms. Go back to that last that equation I showed you, all of the atomic parameters are going to be different. It's got a refractive index value of 2.4. I've also got some, well actually I don't know what that is, it's either a diamond or it's a fake. It could be glass or it could be real. I'm looking at that and I can't tell the difference. But if I can measure the refractive index, my word I can tell the difference because they're hugely different, almost twice as much. And we apply the same principle on the moon. <coughs> So if you have an area of the moon that looks like any other area of the moon, but the refractive index value you're getting tells you it's a different refractive index value, that's a very good indication that it's a different type of material. And so we can map the different types of material on the moon just by using the refractive index value that we're measuring. Now all of that is based on a fairly simple mathematical model, it's all two-dimensional. It's all very nice to have it in a computer on a piece of paper, but it's not really that realistic because the moon isn't a Maltese, um, it's not even a single Maltese. <coughs> it's more complicated than that, and Phil is going to explain how we <laughs> took that on board. <laughs> 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 Actually, I don't know whether to yeah. skip over this and go straight to the experiment. Um, but we, so yeah, we had this mathematical model. Andrew had this mathematical model. Like, <coughs> we could reproduce the property of the relationship between brightness and polarization, and, and put the width of the line down to refractive index. But we weren't entirely convinced, so we thought we'd try a different approach. And this approach is what I did, where I took, in the computer again, made shaped particles and allowed light to bounce around inside them, all through equations and work out what came out of the other side. So in this case, you'd make up these random shaped particles and let pretend light rays from the sun bounce around inside and come out the other side. And that's what's happening on the surface, all these little grains of material on the surface and you imagine the sunlight comes in and bounces off a few grains and then comes out and back to the earth. So what can the computer tell us about what happens in that situation? Well, it gets very complicated, not through 
because there's so many of them, they bounce around like crazy. There's millions of rays, just starting with one ray here. This is what happens inside. Get one, it bounces off, but then some of it goes through, some of it goes, bounces off, and so on. So just starting with one ray, you end up with several coming out. So we tried this approach, and so what I'm showing you is the, uh, this concept of the phase angle, which is the phase of the moon. There's the sun shining on the moon, going down to the telescope, and in this model that would be the same as the sunlight coming in there, going through there and going off to the earth. And we're interested in that relationship between the amount of polarisation and the phase. And we were able to, with this simulation, when we've done 320,000 rays in the simulation, we got this pattern here, which reproduces what astronomers had seen for Mare Tranquility. So we thought, this is good. <laughs> this is the relationship they've seen from the moon between the phase and the amount of polarisation, and that's re reproduced in this computer model, just letting little pretend rays bounce around this little pack of pretend particles. <coughs> so that was good. Does that reproduce this relationship between uh, the lines, the UMOF lines? And the answer is, well, first of all, we need to create some different particles, like Andrew said before. So this is the squashed Malteser model, and here we have, again, a layer which has got some iron, the core, and we can vary all the different types of things in the core. We can vary the amount of iron in here, and we can make packs of particles made of these different compositions. And when we vary the particle sizes, they're all mixed up, so you can't tell much about particle size from your UMOF line. You can't tell much about iron from your UMOF line, because again, they're all mixed up. But when we did refractive index, once again, they all separated themselves out, so we thought, oh, that's good. The second model is showing what the earlier one did. It's showing if you do this diagram, one's on this side, have a different refractive index to the other. So it's a definite result. Well, I thought it was a definite result, but he still wanted more, because he's a physicist, to prove what he <laughs> wanted an experiment. So I did do an experiment as well. Now, here's some experimental stuff. We thought, what can we test? What kind of particles can we test? Well, getting hold of moon dust was tricky. So we bought some. Did try we did try. We got something similar. We have. Silicon Where did you try? BSQ. Oh. <laughs> 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 they were out of stock. <laughs> They're always out of stock. Of it, just yeah. What we did get. Yeah. Actually, there is some pretend moon dust here. We'll tell you about them. The silicon carbide, which is basically used on sandpaper. So that's readily. You can get that in different sizes. You can get that in BSQ, probably. <laughs> and then you get this. Fritz stuff, which is powdered glass, which is used for decorating yeah, for pottery or something, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it, I don't think they were expecting people to buy it for moon experiments, put it that way. So we got this nicely pretty coloured Fritz. You can get lots of nice colours, but we used the black. And then we did eventually get hold of this lunar simulant, it's called, which comes from a, a volcano in Hawaii. And apparently, NASA discovered the volcanic ash inside this volcano is quite similar to uh, Mare materials, so they use it in experiments, rather than handing people, especially people like us, priceless and hollow samples that we might lose in the garage or something, they, they, we managed to get some lunar simulant from someone at Manchester University when, when we expect, explain what we're doing. So this is, this is simulated moon dust. And then what we've got to do is try and make some measurements on that. Uh, so, I built this contraption, I'll let you into a secret here. I've drawn this diagram, which looks, well, I think it looks quite good, but it doesn't tell you what it's, what it's made of. This contraption is made out of Lego. We have everything to write a paper on this, but we're not going to mention Lego. <laughs> we are scientific credentials, just to be a little bit damaged. So, nowadays, so when I was a kid, Lego used to houses and stuff and maybe planes and rockets, but they didn't really fly. This one, nowadays you can get these uh, motors uh, that are controlled by a little computer that's linked to your main computer so you can tell it what to do. So I've got three motors. There's one that, so there's a little turner, so let's start with the basics. Here's the, the little LED light, so that's the sun, okay? Down here in our sample tray that we just saw, there's a bit of moon dust. So the sun is shining on the moon, and the light's reflected off to the Earth, which is where my camera is. And the phase angle is the angle between the light coming in and the light going out, just like we saw before. So as I move the lamp round, it's like the moon changing phase as it turns around the Earth. So what do I need? I need <coughs> one motor here, 
to turn the LED lamp in an arc like that. I have another motor here, because I'm lazy and I've got different samples on. When it's finished measuring one sample, it turns the turntable around, one of those little trays comes around for the next one. And then I have a motor here that turns the polarising filter around in steps. So it starts with the polarising filter, it takes a picture, moves the polarising again, takes another picture, then moves the lamp after it's turned the thing around once, it moves the lamp under the step and repeats till it's finished there. Um, now, there was one complication. When I used up the worm wheels that came with the uh, motor set, I needed a third one for this, and I didn't have a third worm wheel for that. So I had to go to my son and say to him, you know your Star Wars Lego gun turret? <laughs> your Star Wars Lego gun turret has got a little worm wheel in there, and I'd like to have it for my room experiment. And he said, well, what do I get? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to buy two packs of dinosaur cards in order to get hold of this little worm wheel for my experiment. But anyway, bribery worked, and I did get hold of it. So, how does this thing, what kind of results can we get out of this? Well, it turns out when you measure, say, the frit, which is the powdered glass, and you turn the polarizer around, you get these beautiful cos square curves, just like we saw from the moon. <clears throat> so, for one polarizer angle, that's the angle we turn the filter around, we can measure the brightness. We get this curve, <coughs> that little equation I showed you before with the A's and the B's. We'll get the amount of polarization for that glass frit at two different phase angles. We can repeat that for lots of other phase angles. So here's the lamp angle, here's the amount of polarization, and here's the curve you get out of that experiment. And that looks like almost exactly the same shape as those ones we saw earlier out of the particle pack simulation. So we've reproduced again the curve that the professionals measure the shape that they got for Mari Tranquility. So that Lego contraption has measured that thing. Now we know the refractive index of Frit, and we know the refractive index of glass, so we'd expect to get two lines, wouldn't we? Which were a different uh, slope, same slope apart. <coughs> Lo and behold, when I'd done the experiments, this is the line that the contraption measured for the silicon carbide, and this is the line it had measured for the glass. And we know what the refractive index of glass is, and we know what the refractive index of silicon carbide is. And we can put them into an equation, we can work out how far apart they ought to be according to the theory. And the answer was, I think it was 0.289 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And when we measured it from the Lego contraption, it was 0.29. So the theory, that was the wonderful thing. The equations had come up with the same answer that we got from, from the... Uh, yeah, on the other That's what gets the only arbitrary. The papers are going on. So, have I got a bit more sight in this section? <laughs> no, it's back to you now, isn't it? So, yeah, refractive index of the moon. Oh, yes, right. So, um, thank you. So, we're now confident now that we've got this. Uh, we can measure uh, polarization well. We can reproduce the sort of results of the professionals that we produce. Um, but our Mathematical model which seems to predict any way of interpreting this. We've got some of the fact that we have two poles that we can use to interpret it, and it's been supported by experiments. So now we can start to interpret what we get for the moon itself. Now, to help us with that, we can use uh, what knowledge we already have about the refractive index of various bits of the moon, various surface areas, various types of material. <coughs> There are three main players involved uh, on the surface of the moon. There are highland uh, materials, so these are the, the bright uh, mountainous regions of the moon, which show brightly when you look at the, the full moon. And they're dominated by a, a, a mineral called plagioclase, and that has a particular relatively low refractive index value. And then the, the dark patches of the moon, they're, um, they're uh, solidified lava flows, they're basalt dominated by a mineral called pyroxy. All of these have a, a mixture of these two, but in mare it's dominantly that, and in highlands it's dominantly that. And for the mare, the pyroxy, it's a bit higher. And we also know, we're looking at that picture of the moon particles, the real ones that we saw before, there's a lot of impact glass in there. Now the refractive index of that varies quite a lot. These are 
measurements taken of the refractive index of lots of these little beads of, of lunar glass that were brought back by the astronauts. And they, they measured the amount of iron oxide uh, and titanium oxide within the glass, certain types of molecules within the glass. Uh, and they measured the refractive index as well, and they plotted the two together and they found this lovely uh, correlation between the amount of these iron oxide and titanium oxide uh, molecules in the glass and its refractive index. So the more they have, you have of that, the higher the refractive index will be. <coughs> and quite not coincidentally, the range is from um, something similar to plagioclase to something very similar to pyroxy. Basically, what we think is the refractive index of the glass is limited by the refractive index of the rock from which it was melted. It's going to be bounded by those two values. So we can... Oh, another point, another fact to point out is that there's a lot of impact glass in, in lunar dust. It's something like 60-70% of the particles are actually this, this glass material. So it's, it's, a, it's an important factor. <clears throat> and so we can then we can then say, well, if that's the case, um, what we can do is we can compare professional modern measurements of um, iron oxide content or iron content on a certain patch of the moon that's been the, the, these results are from NASA, they've been measured. Actually that's from the is it from the American Air Force? The Air Force the Clementine. Yeah, I think it's an Air Force yeah. experiment yeah, yeah, satellite. Yeah. I think we took a, a ballistic missile, actually, they took the warhead out and they put the little Pro, lunar program and just fired to the moon. We went around the moon taking lots of pictures of the moon, various measurements of the moon, and it produced this map of the amount of iron in the surface. And here we have a map of the refractive index as we've measured it in the same surface. Um, and we would expect that the refractive index is going to be strongly correlated to the amount of titanium oxide, or particularly iron oxide, because there's actually not very much titanium oxide in this region of the moon is dominated by iron. So we would expect to see a similarity in the amount of refractive index and the amount of iron content because a lot, 70% of the lunar surface is this glass which is dominated by the amount of iron in the rock that it was produced from by melting. And we do see a, a similarity. There's a, a V-shape here where the refractive index, where the iron oxide content is low. We get that here, we get large I, uh, refractive index here and here and around these craters and very low around here. We, we get a, a similar sort of picture, telling you, which was encouraging. <coughs> we wanted to take it a little bit further than that and look more closely at where we knew there were differences between um, mineralogy, different types of rock, and therefore we would expect different types of um, refractive index, different values of refractive index. To try and find something that looked more like in, in our results that look more like the, 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 uh, the theoretical results we'll get in this, this parallel banding in the, in the Umhoff plot that we saw from, from our theories. We had a look at the, a crater which is up here, it's called Aristarchus, and it's on this, this area called the Aristarchus Plateau. This is a sort of a, a rectangular region of highland material which has been completely surrounded by a huge flood of lava a long time ago. Here's the lava, <coughs> um, and here's the, the plateau as it was. And then in came a crater at some particular point, uh, an asteroid at some particular point, and produces a huge crater just on the edge. And it, they, they believe it's thrown out material of one type of refractive index, uh, Mare material to one side, and uh, Hyla material to the other side. So we would expect to see uh, a certain type of refractive index here, and a certain type of refractive index there, hopefully. And when we take measurements, so this is a particular measurement we We've taken and looked at this region and this region, for example, just to try and be a bit more clear and a bit more um, circumspect about where we're looking. <coughs> and we've produced a refractive index map using the methods we described before. And we, we plot the polarization. Sorry, I'll step back a little bit. Here we've got an image of the region of Aristarchus. So this region and this region, we've taken the polarisation values of all the data points in here and here. And we've taken the brightness values for all the data points in here and here. And we've plotted the polarisation on here for all of those data points in the squares. And we've plotted the brightness along here. And we get what look like two parallel linear trends in the data, which are very reminiscent of the parallel trends that we saw from our model. 
And on the basis of that, we said, okay, well, in that case, we believe that all of the data points that lie on this line here have the same refractive index. And anything that moves to one side has a different refractive index. In particular, all of the data on here, we find, corresponds to the Aristarchus Plateau, exactly where we would expect it to be. This is a different type of rock, different type of refractive index. Um, the, the data points that lie on the line down here correspond to the uh, marine <coughs> materials. Now, there are bits of data which fall either side by quite some way on here, on this on this linear trend, and that's, that is to say they have a, an anomaly which can't be explained by being a different type of rock, such as these red splodges here have a relatively high refractive index, uh, which we believe is probably to do with some underlying buried material, which is a, a much higher refractive index. They've been overlain by a, a lava flow with a, a material of lower refractive index, and the crater's gone through, thrown up lots of the high refractive index material and it's settled on the surface, which is, we only see it in certain types of crater, which are next to boundaries between lava flows. So we think that's probably what's going on there. But it looks quite encouraging, this, this is particularly encouraging, and it's, <coughs> it's falling on the right terrains at least. So we looked at that idea a little more closely about different stratigraphies, different layers of material that were built up over time. The lower layers have a different type of mineral content to the upper layers, and therefore a different type of refractive index. This is a little schematic to show you how <coughs> this can be investigated. Imagine you have, uh, this is a cross-section, imagine a cross-section of a part of the moon, and say so you have a, a, an ancient surface which is buried by some lava flow that went over the, the top of that sometime. Set all of them. There's another lava flow that went over the top of that, so you have these layers of different material. And then in comes an asteroid, <coughs> and it punches through the top layer into the next layer. And in doing so, it throws out material from the top layer, but it also throws out and digs out material from the lower layer, throws that out onto the surface. And you end up with this halo of different type of material surrounding the crater. So we can we can, we can identify craters that, that have this structure for the professionals that are looking for this as well. And we can ask ourselves, well, do we see a, a halo of different refractive index around the crater? And this is an example of one where we do, one of the well-known ones. This is a crater called uh, Damoiseau E, and then just a refrigerator. There it is. It's in the uh, southwest region of, of the moon. And here's our map of refractive index. Now, the dark region here, this is the Mare region, so this is all lava, this is all relatively high refractive index. And this region to the lower left is highland material. This is the uh, high, uh, lower refractive index, different type of material. Now, the, the crater Damoiseau E is close to the shoreline. It's just inside the sea, as it were, but it's close to the shoreline. And the professionals have shown <coughs> that this particular crater has punched through the lava layer and it's gone right the way down into the, the underlying shore, as it were. And they've, they've used the, the, uh, the US Air Force data to show that indeed this does have a, a halo of um, this sort of material lying on top of the marine material. Excuse me, could we open the door for a few? Yeah, it's going to be quite easy. So, we would then expect to see that we would have a, a low refractive index halo sitting on top of material high refractive index. And that is, in fact, what we do see. If, if this crater hadn't punched through into a different material underneath, you wouldn't see this blue splotch here. This blue splotch tells you that there's the wrong sort of material sat on top of the lava here, this lava flow. So that's very encouraging. This, this fits well with, with what the, the professionals here have been doing. We're quite encouraged by that. Um, and there's another crater called Dionysius, where we've done the same thing recently. And Phil had done some magic with his software. Oh, yeah. software. Yes. You want to finish up on that? I am, yeah. I'll be very quick now. If you're nearly passing out with it, you can just we'll finish. This is an observation that our third party, our third member of our team, Chris, did. 
he seems to get way more clear nights than we down in, do, he's down in Oxford, so he's produced loads and loads of observations. This Dionysius crater, he observed, and there's some data from the, again, from the Clementine probe that shows that the amount of iron around, the iron oxide around, is this green splodge, and, and our results can, can reproduce that, so we're very pleased that we can see that. What Andrew was saying about the, the 3D representation, in fact, this is uh, Chris's observation of Dionysius, and I've got some data off the NASA website for the elevation of all the points and put his picture over, over the, the, the 3D elevation map so you can see the, the bright halo of material around the crater. All the shading is due to his observation and the elevation is due to the, to the space probe. And then as a final slide, then we put the refractive index of the material on there so we can see this lighter region around the edge. That's really what I wanted to leave it, just to say we've been at this for a long time, as you can probably imagine. And I've learned a lot, certainly about physics and polarisation and all that stuff. I've also learned when Andrew says an equation is quite simple. <laughs> no, my eyes are going to spin, they're going to spin around. And I suppose it's about science as well. You know, the amount of time we actually spend doing observations is quite small. The amount of time we spend computer programming is enormous. In comparison, but it has been good fun, and um, I think we're hoping that we've discovered something new, and we're hoping to put, publish it, and uh, and then we'll carry on uh, moonlighting as scientists. <laughs> <laughs>
a uh, polarising filter mm -hmm. and I couldn't find any difference whatsoever in all the pictures that I took. What, did you move the polarizer around? Yes, yes. Well the difference is quite subtle as you saw. You yeah, know, it's, it's almost that sort of thing. You can see the damn thing. Can I ask what the phase of the moon was? Was it full moon? Uh, well, I would, no, I would, the idea was to try and improve a full moon. Because right. I, I usually take, you know, the shadow across. Yeah. Um, but it didn't seem to do anything. Now, that full moon it won't do anything. What, no, what, what I, 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 the question I'm going to ask, and you may not be able to answer, these modern filters are called um, circular filters, yes. simply because of the autofocus mm -hmm. business. Whereas years ago, a polarising filter was something equivalent to um, a Venetian blind, if you like, mm -hmm. stress in the material. Mm -hmm. Would that make any difference to be a no, the effect should be the same. It's rather like we were talking to Chris. Yeah, we just started using circular polarizers ourselves. They do have a further oh, advantage. So yeah, yeah. But, 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 but either can either can be used. Yeah. Yeah. If, this, if this guy's been you looking at the full moon, he's been looking at light that's reflected almost sort of on and off. So it wouldn't it'd be, it'd be a reflection. That would be in all uh, where the, 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 the sort of vibrations are in all the same. It wouldn't be polarized. It's, polarized. it's got to be. You, you really got to have the sun at 90 degrees. Pretty much half moon. And then you well, get I the polarization. I did it through, I did it through the entire range of, of moon. All oh, right, the whole the whole nation. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, it wasn't just right. a picture. I spent a hell of a long time. Right. <laughs> and I thought, what a waste. <laughs> Man, you've got some very good pictures. <laughs> Yeah, as I say, the, the, the variation in brightness is quite subtle, 10, 15%, 10, that's yeah. quite hard to see yeah. by eye. I think, I think I would see it. Right, well it is there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know why you didn't see it, no. it is there, yes. Perhaps I expect you too much. <laughs> Are there any questions in relation to what is the moon, what does it look like? It's quite a, well it's been totally mapped, both sides, um, yes. the, the, the other side of the moon, so there's quite a lot of interest in the moon itself. They don't really know the what the topography yeah. of the moon. What they're just, can can I ask you another bit, uh, Aristarchus, he's supposed to be the brightest crater, is it, on the moon? Well, one of them, yeah. Is that because of what you were describing before the impact and the halo around it, or is there anything special that makes it the brightest? Um, partly because it's relatively young, so it hasn't gone through as much space weathering. The space weathering across all those tiny iron beads, they, they make it darker and redder. Um, so it's young, it's still relatively bright. I haven't got a sunburn yet. Um, and also, yes, partly because a lot of the material is this highland type material, which is intrinsically quite exactly, bright. Anyway. Yeah. So two factors make it quite bright. But the uh, the depths of the uh, craters and everything does that actually depend as well on what you were saying about the size of the uh, the crystals or the actual <coughs> land of size of the meteor or whatever? Is is there a difference in that? Like you were saying before, if it was like an ocean on the moon, mm. uh, it was a different layers where one side was like a, a lava side and the other side was mm. more. Rocky, would that be the same if it was here in water? Would if you had the same size weight meteor hitting the Earth, mm. uh, would it still come out as that? What you were saying as dispersing? Um, yeah, well, it, it does. So basically, how would it make as big a hole on Earth? Does the size of the hole depend on the thing it hits? Is what you say? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but also with the water content, we obviously we could slow it down enough. For the impact to change that as well, if you think. Well, the the size of the crater is, is just dependent on on the amount of energy that's carried by the asteroid because the asteroid is just vaporized. There's so much energy involved. And the the sort of impacts that produce these craters we can see from Earth, and because I mean, do you know if you remember how big Dionysus is? There's about ten kilometers, fifteen kilometers across. Yeah, I think it's a bit, yes, something like that. So they're pretty big. I mean, they're, yeah, they're that's big what I said. So because there's nothing, there's no atmosphere as such. I oh, see. Yeah, there's no breaking effect. Yeah. yeah. It, would that, would that, does that make a difference? Because I was thinking like, when we were talking last time about Mars and stuff like mm -hmm. that, um, I mean, they're trying to sort of prove about being water on Mars, mm -hmm. you know, so many aliens away years ago and mm -hmm. whatever. 
that's what I was just thinking to myself. Would that make a difference of the size of what you're looking at as a reflection from the light from where we are now, if you see what I mean? Um, well, the, the... The size the, of the particles. The, right. Uh, no, I don't think it would make a difference to the size of the particles. Uh, if, it's, if there's enough energy to make a crater that we can see at all from Earth, then there's a lot of energy, oh, which right. just basically vaporizes uh, and pulverizes uh, randomly. Uh, there might be, for the smaller impacts, the craters that might be maybe a couple of meters, tens of meters across, I think that might be a factor where the, the strength of the material has a big influence on how, how, big, how much it's pulverized. So that, that might make uh, a difference Another in terms of the size of the crater. But yeah, and the other thing as well, obviously with the meteor that's actually hit the moon, I mean obviously that's made up of particles itself. Mm -hmm. So does that actually go in as well to the uh, sizes of different particles that's not the moon, but is actually the, the, the asteroid on the meteor? Um, is that, would it, that, yeah, would that alter it? It, it could do. Um, bear in mind, I think, I'll give you an example of, about of, of the, the relative sizes of things. Are you, are you familiar with Meteor? There's, a, there's a, a, well, a, f a famous crater in Arizona, I think it is called. Yeah, yeah. Barringer yeah. crater, yeah, I think yeah, it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's something like a kilometre, a kilometre and a half across, something like that. I yeah. believe, you correct me if I'm wrong, I think the, the thing that, the, the body that produced it was something like a... It's like a plane, wasn't it? Yeah, it's like a plane. Yeah, it's like a plane. It was, plane. It was yeah. a London bus or something. Yeah. 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 It was it going pretty very, pretty very fast, though. Pretty so small. it had a lot of yeah. kinetic yeah. energy. Exactly. Yeah. But pretty small, relatively speaking. So the volume of material that's been thrown out of the ground is far, far oh, bigger yeah. than the volume yeah. of material that produced the energy. Right. So if you if you look at the ratios, it's going to be a tiny fraction of a percent. I've, uh, so I've there could be some problem. the edge of that crater and to look around it, hundreds yeah. of miles, it's flattened. Yeah. So it's a quite an amazing sound. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. To, to what extent do you simplify this? Because you know, you've not just got two refractive indices there. You know, there's going to be on the moon, there's yeah. going to be loads of. There's a whole range of them. Uh, these are, at least you can see so a whole range of them. So, presumably, those are predominant ones that you measure. Yeah, we think that there's these two predominant minerals that will primarily make up the highland and the mare. And obviously, towards the edges of the mares, they're mixed up. So, there's the, the aggregate refractive index is sort of the blend of the two. You know, so you can get values, all different values in between, depending on how much of these two sets of particles you mix together. You can sort of see that a little bit on that map actually, if you look at the... Uh, actually, yeah, it's better. Here, you can see the, uh, the impact sprays come out. And this is yeah. high refractive <coughs> material from the, from the mare. And it's punched through and gone down into the low refractive index material which was buried previously. But as you get further and further away, it sort of melts, it mixes in and it melts, so it goes from strong yellow to sort of greeny, and it goes back to, to the, almost purely, the, uh, the highland material. So this sort of transition between strongly one type and strongly another type, you see all over the place. But there are certain areas where the, uh, the differences are well defined, and this is an example of one of those. We were looking for the well defined regions where it's pretty clearly one type. And pretty clearly other types, so we could use that to test whether we could actually see that in the refractive index. But in most places, it's a, it's a bit of a mix. It's, it's shades of grey. Um, we think we can use the, the same um, procedure to map that shade of grey in terms of refractive index rather than just brightness. So we can see where uh, the, perhaps relative, the relative proportions of different types of mineral as you progress across a boundary between highland and mare how that changes and, and where something odd is happening, like here for example, There's something strange happening over there. There's a crater there which seems to have dug out some material which is unusually high in refractive index, so that's, that's what I'm at. I'm not sure why. But, um, probably You're continuing the research, are you, to find yeah. out why? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, people can do with a break in a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> the, after the meeting, after the, the, the break, if you want to come <coughs> quite welcome to do so, we'll be just talking about the grant we've got and also pr producing the guide for the new members. So I think that will have some interest for you. We've got a couple of uh, PowerPoints, very short PowerPoints, just to show you afterwards.
but can I at this stage thank Phil and Andrew very much for a very technical talk, but hopefully it was interesting as well as technical. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.